In this video, we want to talk about a model that we call the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. And I'll say this several times throughout this video, this model works mechanically a lot like a, a plain old demand supply model, but it is very different from a plain demand and supply model. What we're going to be thinking about is aggregate demand. So in the stuff that we did at the beginning of the semester when we were talking about demand and supply, we were thinking about demand for a single good and supply for a single good. With the aggregate demand model, we're going to be thinking about demand for everything in the economy all at once and the supply of everything in the economy all at once. Now the nice thing about this model is this model allows us to kind of understand what causes economic fluctuations. And so we'll be able to understand the things that can lead to a recession and we'll be able to use this model to think about um, the things that we can do to try to get out of a recession. We'll be able to understand what leads to expansions. And so this will be a very useful model for figuring out why economies fluctuate from one time period to the next. We need to start by thinking about some key facts, key things that we know about economic fluctuations. So the first thing that we know about economic fluctuations is that they are irregular and unpredictable. Irregular and unpredictable. There will be, you will, if you pay attention, you will run into many people who will try to convince you that they know when the next recession or when the next expansion is coming. Oftentimes those people will be trying to sell you a book or sell you an investment or sell you something else, information. And they may be very convincing in trying to convince you that they, uh, they know what they're talking about. But one thing that we know from, from history is that the business cycle is irregular and unpredictable. Now, it's unfortunate that economists call the business cycle the business cycle because that word cycle implies that there's some regular pattern. And so if you were to look at, in mathematics, if you were to look at a sine wave, a function of the sine function or the cosine function, it's a regular and predictable pattern. In terms of the business cycle, it is not regular or predictable. So that's the first thing that we know. Another thing that we know is that most macro variables fluctuate together. Most macroeconomic variables fluctuate together. Now let's talk about what that means. That doesn't mean that they all move in the same direction or by the same amount. But when things start to move, Typically, lots of stuff starts to move. We start to see incomes changing and at the same time we see firm profits changing. Let's suppose we go into a recession and so incomes are going to be going down and firm profits are going to be going down and foreclosures will be going up and unemployment starts to go up and the price level starts to move and interest rates start to move. So we start to see lots of stuff move together. And again, not all of them move in the same direction and they don't all move in the same amounts. And so um, that doesn't mean that as soon as you see one thing move, you know what's going to happen to the other things. It's, it's challenging. But we know that things tend to move together. And then another key thing that we know is that as output falls, unemployment rises. As output falls, unemployment rises. Remember that we use output, GDP, to measure incomes. So we can think about this in terms of incomes. Output is how we measure income. As income falls, unemployment rises. Okay. So those are kind of three key things that we know historically about economic fluctuations. Now, let's talk about how we're going to 
use this model. This model is actually what we would call a short run model. All of the things that we've talked to or talked about in this class up to this point, we've talked about in the long run. So those models where we were thinking about um, um, the demand and supply for loanable funds or the, uh, the things that caused unemployment to go up or down, all of those things were monetary neutrality. neutrality. All of those things were long run models. This aggregate demand aggregate supply model is a short run model. And this helps us understand what causes short run fluctuations in an economy. It can be very useful. So our model focuses on the relationship between two things. So let's say it this way. This model focuses on the relationship between the price level and real GDP. Focuses on the relationship between those two things. Now let's think about that for a second because if you think back to when we talked about monetary neutrality, we talked about the fact that you can divide different economic variables into two groups, those that we call nominal and those that we call real. And what we saw is that changes in the money supply have impacts on nominal variables but not real variables. In other words, inflation doesn't matter. But what that is is a long run model. Inflation doesn't matter in the long run. If the Fed adjusts the money supply, then that changes the price level. But if all prices change, it doesn't really matter. Well, this model is a short run model. In the long run, there would be no relationship between the price level, which is a nominal variable, and real GDP, which is a real variable. In the long run, those are different types of variables that are not related to each other. But in the short run, they can be. And so that's the key thing that's new about what we're going to do in this chapter. Now, let's think about what this aggregate demand, aggregate supply model looks like, because it's going to look very familiar to you. It's going to work very different. So, in terms of what the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model looks like, here's what we do. We put the price level up here. Sometimes I'll just call it P. At least at the beginning of when we start working with this, I'll try to write the price level because I don't want you to think that if I write P up there that it's just the price of one good. This is the average level of prices in the economy. And then down here, we're going to put real GDP. This is, let's write it first, real GDP. This is Y, like Y equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. Real GDP. Now, once we get comfortable with this, I'm just going to switch to calling it P and Y, but I want you to remember that this is the total amount of goods and services bought and sold in the economy. And this is the average level of all of those prices in the economy. Now, our aggregate demand curve is going to be downward sloping. I'll typically abbreviate it AD. And our aggregate supply curve is going to be upward sloping. For right now, I'm going to label it AS. We'll see that there are actually two different aggregate supply curves. But for right now, let's just talk about that. So in terms of how this looks, this looks like a, any other demand supply model that we've talked about. Our equilibrium is going to be found right there at the intersection. And so I'll call this P star. That's going to be the equilibrium price level in this economy. And this will be Y star. This will be the equilibrium level of real GDP in the economy. So the intersection gives us the equilibrium. But now let's think about what each of these curves shows. This aggregate demand curve shows the total quantity of goods and services bought or demanded in the economy at each price level. And we can see that at higher price levels, 
overall demand in the economy is lower than it is at lower price levels. At low price levels, people want to buy more stuff. And we'll talk about why here in a second. Our aggregate supply curve represents the total amount of goods and services that firms want to sell at each price level. At low price levels, firms want to sell a relatively small amount of goods and services. And at higher price levels, they want to sell a relatively high amount. And we'll talk about why that's true here in just a little bit. But this is very different from a regular demand and supply curve. So let's think about what a regular demand curve looks like. So there, if this was a regular demand curve, we would just have the price of whatever this good is, and we would have the quantity of that good. And what this tells us is that at a price like P1, the quantity demanded is high, Q1. And at higher prices, quantity demanded falls. At a price like P2, quantity demanded falls to Q2. And let's think about why that happens. We talked about that earlier on in the semester. As prices rise, two things happen. There's an income effect and a substitution effect. The income effect says that as the price of something you buy goes up, that has a negative impact on your income and you tend to buy less because of that. The substitution effect says as the price of something you buy goes up, other things become cheaper in comparison and you substitute towards those other things. So for a regular demand curve, it's downward sloping because of the income and substitution effects. That's not happening in this picture. And the reason is this demand curve represents demand for all goods and services. Every good is represented along that demand curve. So there's nothing else to substitute towards. So it slopes downward for a very different reason than a regular demand curve slopes downward. And the same with a supply curve. When we are talking about just a regular supply curve for one good, that's very different from the aggregate supply curve that represents how much goods and services all firms want to sell of all goods and services depending upon the price level. So keep that in mind as we go through here. Let's start by thinking about aggregate demand. We want to think about why the aggregate demand curve slopes down. In other words, why is it that when the price level changes, people want to buy more stuff or less stuff? And then we need to think about what causes the aggregate demand curve to shift around. So the key to understanding aggregate demand is to remember this, Y equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. So GDP, this is the national income identity. GDP, any dollar that's in GDP is either going to be consumption or investment or government spending or net exports. This one, G, is determined by government policy. So let's just say that one has to do with government policy. The government chooses that one. So we don't need to worry about that one right now. What we want to know is how does the price level affect consumption, investment, and net exports. Why does the price level change the amount of goods and services that people want to consume? Why would the price level change the number of dollars that firms want to invest? Remember investment is when firms buy buildings and equipment to make more output in the future. Why is it that the price level would change our net exports, which is exports minus imports? So let's start by thinking about consumption. So when we think about consumption, the key thing that we're going to talk about here is what we call the wealth effect. So here's what the wealth effect says. The wealth effect says that when, when prices fall, dollars are more valuable. When prices go down, your dollar buys more. And so consumers feel wealthier, and as a consequence, they buy more stuff. Okay? So a decrease in the price level 
will lead to an increase in consumption because of the wealth effect. Now, let's keep in mind, this is a short run model. In the long run, consumers would realize that if all prices change, then it's not just the prices of what they buy that's gone down, but the price of their labor has also gone down. But we're talking about the short run right now. Okay? So a decrease in the price level will increase consumption. And that means that because consumption is a part of real GDP, a decrease in the price level causes more goods and services in total to be demanded. Let's talk about now investment. And this is something that we're going to call the interest rate effect. So let's think about how this works. So when prices fall, people need to hold less money to engage in transactions. And when you need to hold less money, you lend your money out. Well, that lending of your money out decreases the interest rate. And when the interest rate goes down, investment goes up. When the interest rate goes down, it costs firms less to borrow to invest. And so in this case, a decrease in the price level will lead to an increase, oops, lead to an increase in investment. A decrease in the price level causes that one to go up as well. And then finally, Let's talk about net exports. And we'll talk about the net export effect. So with the net export effect, when prices fall, we just talked about the fact that interest rates are going to go down because people need to hold less money and they lend it out. Well, if interest rates go down, then people are, who are looking to save money by buying assets are going to look outside the country because interest rates in this country are going to be going down. So savers will be buying assets denominated in foreign dollars. And we could talk about how that causes the exchange rate to change, but let's just say that that causes the dollar to get weaker compared to other currencies. And when that happens, when foreigners' dollars get stronger compared to ours, or foreigners' currencies get stronger compared to ours, that stimulates our exports. So, a decrease in the price level causes an increase in net exports. When our dollar gets weaker, we buy less from other countries and other countries buy more from us and net exports goes up. So all three of these things, when the price level goes down, it causes consumption to go up, it causes investment to go up, it causes net exports to go up. So a decrease in the price level will lead to an increase in the amount of stuff that firms and households and other countries want to buy from us. So that helps you understand, hopefully, why the aggregate demand curve slopes downward. Now what we want to do is talk about why the aggregate demand curve might shift. So what we need to do now is focus on something other than the price level. Because we've got the price level here, then changes in the price level will move us to a new point on this aggregate demand curve. But if we talk about something other than the price level changing, then that aggregate demand curve will shift. So let's talk about shifts in aggregate demand. And the best way to think about shifts in aggregate demand, again, is to think about shifts that have to do with consumption, investment, government spending, net exports. Anytime you're thinking about aggregate demand, remember this, this national income identity. That'll help you try to remember all of the things that can cause the aggregate demand curve to shift. So let's think about shifts from consumption. So what are the things that can cause consumptions, consumptions to change? So 
anything that causes people to um, be pessimistic or optimistic about the future. It's easier to think about people becoming pessimistic. So when people become pessimistic about the future, they quit spending their money. So anything like a terrorist attack or anything like a virus that, that causes people to be scared to go out or something like a rule that says you can't go out and spend your money. You've got to stay in your house clearly is going to decrease consumption. So we could think about um, pessimism. That can be uh, caused by a war or um, virus, right? Or it could be some scandal in the White House or, or any of a thousand other things, a terrorist attack. Let's put that. Could be a stock market crash or there's an infinite number of things that can cause people to become pessimistic or optimistic about the future. When optimism takes over, people are more confident and they go out and they think about buying a car or they think about replacing a dishwasher or they think about spending their money. We can also have shifts that come about from investment. This is very similar to consumption, except now with investment, we're talking about firms. So if we think about, um, say, new computer technology, so if some new, um, let's say, faster processors are invented that would increase productivity, then firms will start to invest in that. Um, but it can also be things like this, a virus, right? So, or the government just telling you that you, you can't operate your business. Well, if you can't operate your business, your business is not going to be buying buildings or equipment. So firms becoming pessimistic about the future, that will cause a shift in aggregate demand. It will change the amount of investment that firms engage in. We can think about, um, let's say, tax incentives. So if the government increases taxes, say income taxes for consumers or for firms, that leaves fewer dollars for, for consumers or firms to spend. And so an increase in um, Taxes is going to decrease aggregate demand, or a decrease in taxes would increase it. We can also think about the money supply. Now, this one I'm not going to talk about. Misspelled supply. I'm not going to talk about right now because we're going to spend our next chapter thinking about a lot about that one. So I'm just going to kind of sneak it in right here, and then we'll come back to that one later. We can also, and, and tax incentives, this applies to both investment and consumption. Let's go to government spending. Clearly, the government can decide to spend money on roads or whatever they want to spend money on, and an increase in G will cause the aggregate demand curve to shift to the right. A decrease in G will cause the aggregate demand curve to shift to the left. So the government could spend their money on buildings or um, new fighter jets or any of a million things that the government spends money on. Then we could have uh, shifts from net exports. So this could come about because there's a recession in Europe. If there's a recession in Europe and um, incomes in Europe are falling, then they're going to be buying less stuff from us. And that will decrease our net exports. So anything that happens in another country, a virus in other countries, will cause those other countries to buy less from us, and that impacts us. So all of these things, you can have shifts in aggregate demand that come from consumption, shifts from investment, 
shifts from government spending, shifts from net exports. I'm sneaking in money supply right there. We'll come back to that. So now we know why the aggregate demand curve slopes downward. That's this stuff. Now we know what causes aggregate demand to shift. That's that stuff right there. What we need to do now is think about aggregate supply. So I'll clear this off and we'll take a look at that. I mentioned at the beginning of this that there are actually two aggregate supply curves. We're going to start with the simple one. Actually, both of them are pretty simple. But we'll start with the most straightforward one first, and that is the um, long-run aggregate supply curve. So let's take a quick look at what that's going to look like. We've got our price level up here, which is P. We've got real GDP down here. which is Y. Our aggregate supply in the long run is going to be vertical. And I'm going to denote it long run aggregate supply. What this means is, anytime you've got one that's vertical, what this means is that the price level doesn't have any impact on our long run aggregate supply. In other words, if the price level's low, here's what long run aggregate supply is. Or if the price level is high, here's what long run aggregate supply is. Okay. This really reflects that um, monetary neutrality that we talked about in an earlier video. The short run aggregate supply is going to be upward sloping, but let's focus on this one right now. So in the long run, in the long run, GDP is determined by things like factor supplies, inputs that we've got, resources that we've got, technology that we've got in the long run. Now in the short run, it can be determined by other things, but in the long run, real GDP is determined by things like technology, inputs, right? how many workers we've got, how many raw materials we've got. Um, it's determined by technology, inputs, um, let's just say um, workers, let's add that as a separate one because we'll break that out here in a second. We've got a name, actually, for this point where the long-run aggregate supply curve is vertical, and we call that the natural rate of output. Natural rate of output. That's the amount of stuff that we produce in the economy when the unemployment rate is at its natural rate. Remember, the natural rate of unemployment is not zero. There's always some unemployment in the economy. But that's our natural rate of output. So the amount of stuff that we can um, produce when the economy is operating at its natural rate of output, sometimes we call that full employment output. The amount of output that we can produce there is going to be determined by things like technology, inputs, workers, that kinds of, those kinds of things, not the price level. So let's think about what causes the, what causes long run aggregate supply to shift. So we can have shifts from labor. That's an important thing. If we have more workers, immigration, then that will shift our long run aggregate supply to the right. Um, or if we had uh, an increase in the minimum wage. So let's suppose we have increase in minimum wage. Remember that an increase in the minimum wage results in unemployment. That results in less people working. 
that decreases our long run aggregate supply to the left. Um, we could have changes in unemployment policy. So anything that, that makes being unemployed less painful will result in people being unemployed for longer periods of time and shift long run aggregate supply to the left. We can have shifts from capital. And this can be human or physical capital. So anything that increases the amount of capital, let's say an increase in the capital stock, will result in an increase in long run aggregate supply. It allows us to produce more goods and services in the economy. We can have shifts from natural resources. So if all of a sudden um, some new natural resources are discovered in the country, then that will increase the amount of goods and services that we can produce. We can have shifts from technology. If we have a technology improvement, that can allow us to use the same natural resources and the same capital and the same labor, but be able to make more output. So all of those things can cause our long run aggregate supply to increase. Now with what we've got here, we've got aggregate demand and now we've talked about aggregate supply. That allows us to help understand why we tend to observe changes in output and changes in the price level in the long run. So let's take a look at using this simple model to, to think about the effect of long run growth in the economy and inflation. So let's draw a quick picture and put together the aggregate demand curve that we've got and that long run aggregate supply. Up here we've got our price level and down here we've got real GDP. So this is P, this is Y. Let's put our aggregate demand here. I'm going to call that aggregate demand curve 1 and we'll call this long run aggregate supply 1. Our intersection is right here so here's our initial price level and our initial level of real GDP. So if we think about an economy over time, we can think about what happens to both aggregate demand and aggregate supply over time. And what we tend to see over time is that the aggregate demand curve shifts to the right and we tend to see long run aggregate supply shift to the right. One of the bit main increasers of aggregate demand tends to be monetary policy. Remember we talked about the fact that the money supply increases aggregate demand. So if from time period one to a time period in the future we get an increase in aggregate demand to aggregate demand two and we get an increase in long run aggregate supply to long run aggregate supply two then what we will observe over time is increases in real GDP, increases in incomes, real incomes, and inflation. And that's what we tend to see in the United States, especially over time. We tend to see that incomes, real incomes have risen, and we tend to see inflation in the economy. And the sources of those things, at least we can use this model to help understand, the sources would be monetary policy that shifts aggregate demand and changes in technology that shifts long run aggregate supply. What we need to do now is we need to take a look at short run aggregate supply and then we'll be able to see what happens, uh, what re causes short run fluctuations in the economy. So I'll clear this off and then we'll do that. So we've talked about
the aggregate demand curve and we've talked about the long run aggregate supply curve. What we want to do now is think about the short run aggregate supply curve. And it turns out that the short run aggregate supply curve slopes upward. And so let's just take a quick look at what it looks like. So remember we've got our, our price level up here. We've got the real level of GDP down here. Our short run aggregate supply is going to look like this. It's going to be upward sloping. What this means is that at low price levels, there's a small quantity of goods and services available that all of the firms in the economy want to sell. And then at high price levels, all firms are going to want to sell more. So what we've got to think about is why would a change in the price level cause firms to want to sell more or less. And so there are some ideas that economists have come up with to try to um, explain why this relationship might hold in the short run. And, and let me remind you something that I've, I've reminded you of throughout this uh, chapter. This is a short run model. In the long run, um, there wouldn't be any relationship between the two. And of course, that's what the long run aggregate supply curve shows. That's why the long run aggregate supply curve is vertical because changes in the price level don't influence that um, natural rate of output. There are, are three potential explanations that economists have come up with that might explain this relationship. The first is what we're going to call the sticky wage theory. And the idea here is that nominal wages are slow to adjust, or essentially they're sticky. Okay, so what this means is that if the price level rises while nominal wages are stuck, and those nominal wages might be stuck because of um, labor contracts. So maybe you agree to work at a particular job um, over the next year for a particular wage, that nominal wage. Let's say they're going to pay you a certain number of dollars per hour, or if you work for a salary, you're going to be working for, you're going to sign a contract that says, I'm going to work for X number of dollars for the next year. And then at the end of that year, you can renegotiate that contract. But during the period of time that that contract applies, your nominal wage is going to be stuck. So if the price level rises while nominal wages are stuck, then for those firms that are paying the wage, the real wage that they have to pay actually goes down. So if the price level rises, then firms are able to sell their output for, for more than they used to, but their input costs are not going up because the wages that they have to pay are sticky. And that benefits the firms. And so as the price level goes up, their real wages that they have to pay are falling and consequently they sell more. So they increase production of goods and services at higher price levels. They would decrease production of goods and services at lower price levels. You can just reverse that argument that I just made, and that would tell you why at low price levels they want to sell a smaller quantity. So that's the sticky wage theory. And it's just one of three possible explanations that we're going to think about. The second one that we're going to think about is sticky price theory. And the idea here is that the prices of some goods and services are slow to adjust. So when economic conditions change, um, maybe it's because of something like menu costs for um, firms. Maybe it's costly for them to change their prices frequently so they don't change them frequently. And so when the price level changes, some, ch some prices in the economy are just kind of sticky for a while. So what happens here is that because some prices are sticky, when the price level goes up, for, for the firms whose prices are sticky, that leaves them with relatively lower prices than the other firms out there in the economy. And because of that, because they have relatively low um, prices, that stimulates sales for those firms and they consequently sell more. So 
Clearly not a, a long run situation because in the long run they would be changing their prices. But in the short run, that one, uh, I, I guess that, that could happen. Um, and then the third one is what we call misperceptions theory. The idea behind the misperceptions theory is that a change in the price level causes firms to misperceive what's going on. So they perceive that change in the price level as a change in just their relative prices. They don't realize that all prices in the economy are going to be changing. So essentially they mistake a change in the overall price level for a change in their relative price. So when the price goes up, they don't realize it's inflation. They think that it's maybe increased demand for their product that's driving the price of their product up. And so they sell more. So if we think about these, if you were to ask me personally what I think about them, I find the sticky wage theory to be somewhat reasonable. I think that there, there are wages that, that are sticky over certain periods of time, and maybe that leads to, to what we're seeing here. And there, it seems reasonable to me that there can be some sticky prices out there in the economy, sticky output prices. This one has to do with input prices being sticky. The idea here is that output prices may be sticky as well, and, and maybe they are. Misperceptions theory, honestly, I, personally, I don't find that one to be very convincing. I think businesses aren't going to make this mistake for very long at all. And if, they, if you're a business person and you're, you tend to make that kind of mistake, probably not going to be a business person for very long. Now, the idea here is that it could be some combination of all three of these. These aren't explanations that rule out each other. And so... Maybe it's that at different periods of time and maybe to different extents, maybe all three of these um, are explanations for what we see here in terms of the upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve. So the idea here is that all of them tell us that the real amount of output that gets produced is going to be different when, or it's going to be affected when the price level is something other than what firms expect. If they, if they get surprised by the price level, then there's going to be a change in this amount of output that they produce. And we can actually identify a, a kind of a mathematical equation that will help us hopefully understand this. So the amount of output supplied, let's say the quantity of output supplied is going to be equal to the natural rate of output plus A multiplied by a couple of things. It's going to be the difference inside these parentheses. It's going to be the difference between the actual price level and the expected price level. So let's think about what this means. If firms are right in terms of what they expect about the price level, if the actual price level turns out to be exactly what they expect, then the actual price level minus the expected price level, this term is going to be zero and this whole term will cancel out over here. It'll be A times zero. That term just falls out. And in that period of time, the quantity of output supplied is just the natural rate of output. But if firms are surprised by the amount of output, if the actual price, or excuse me, surprised by the um, price level that exists in a particular time period, if the actual price level turns out to be something different from what they expect, then this term will not be zero. We will multiply it by A, and then the amount of output that particular time period will be the natural rate plus or minus some term over here. The, um, the magnitude of A determines how big the 
surprise in price level, how big of an impact that has on the quantity of output. Okay, so if the actual price level turns out to be something higher than what they expect, so if, if there's unexpected inflation, then the actual price level minus the express, expected price level would be a positive number multiplied by A. We would add that to the natural rate of output. Remember that the lo long run aggregate supply curve is vertical at the natural rate of output. Here's the natural rate. So as long as we're not, as firms are not surprised by the price level, then the natural rate is just the natural rate, and we the price level would have no impact. But if the price level turns out to be higher than what firms expect, then we're going to have a, a higher quantity of output than the natural rate, or if the price level, the actual price level, turns out to be lower than what firms expect, then this term would be negative, and then it would be the natural rate of output minus some amount. Here's the natural rate of output minus some amount. It would be back here. And so this formula here kind of helps you understand why the natural rate of output, or why the amount of output supplied in a particular period would be higher when the price level ends up being higher than what they expect and why the amount of output would be lower when the price level is lower than what firms would expect. Now in terms of how you use this, this is really just to help you understand what's going on in that picture. This isn't something that on a test I would give you uh, whatever three out of the four things and ask you to solve for the fourth. There's no reason I couldn't, but it's not something that I typically put on a test. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what's going on with the short run aggregate supply curve. Let's talk about um, things that shift short run aggregate supply. Things that shift short run aggregate supply. And this is actually pretty easy because the same things that shift the long run aggregate supply curve also shift the short run aggregate supply curve. So let's say all of the things that shift long run aggregate supply also shift short run aggregate supply. So let's just briefly review those. We talked about um, the long run aggregate supply curve shifting if something about the amount of labor that we've got changed. So we can get changes from labor. So if there's immigration into the U.S., then that means there are more workers that will shift the long run aggregate supply curve and the short run aggregate supply curve to the right. It is not the case that when somebody comes into the country and finds a job that that means that there's one less job for other people to take. That's not the way the world works. We talked in a previous video about the idea that Oftentimes people think that the world is a zero-sum game. It is not the case that there's a fixed number of jobs out there, and if one person takes a job, that's a job that can't be had by another person. When those aggregate supply curves shift to the right, we'll talk about what happens here in a little bit, that increases the amount of goods and services that we can produce. And so um, we can have changes from labor. We also talked about changes from capital. So when the capital stock increases, more equipment, more buildings, when the capital stock increases, that increases the, uh, that shifts the short run aggregate supply curve to the right and it shifts long run aggregate supply. We talked about changes from natural resources. We talked about changes from technology. All of those things will shift both the aggregate supply curves to the right. But now there's a new thing that shifts the short run aggregate supply curve that does not shift the long run aggregate supply curve. So let's say, uh, but there's a new thing. And that thing is the expected price level. 
expected price level. When firms change their expectations about the price level, that will shift that short run aggregate supply curve to the right. Now that does not shift the long run aggregate supply curve. We didn't talk about that when we were thinking about long run aggregate supply and the idea there is that long run aggregate supply has to do with these things, real things. Short run aggregate supply has to do with some real things but also a nominal thing, a monetary thing. Okay? And the expected price level, the expected amount of inflation or deflation that we're going to experience. So here's the idea, here's the logic behind this. If, let's say there's an increase in the expected price level, increase in the expected price level, let's think about how firms will, will think about that. Increase in the expected price level, that's going to lead to firms expecting to have to pay more for inputs in the future. Firms expect to pay more for inputs. Oops. Firms expect to pay more for inputs. And when input prices go up, that means firms are going to decrease the amount, the quantity supplied of goods and services. So this is going to lead to a decrease in quantity supplied of goods and services. And anytime there's a decrease in the quantity supplied of goods and services, short run aggregate supply shifts to the left. Let's say decreases, short run aggregate supply decreases. So if firms expect a higher price level, then if we're looking at a short run aggregate supply curve and it's sitting right there, short run aggregate supply, we'll call it short run aggregate supply one. Here's the price level, here's real GDP. If firms expect the price level to be higher in the future, that's going to shift this short run aggregate supply curve to the left. If firms expect a lower price level in the future, that would shift the short run aggregate supply curve to the right. Okay. Changes in the expected price level don't have any impact on the long run aggregate supply. It's just the short run aggregate supply. So now, let's just kind of recap what we've done. We talked about the aggregate demand curve. <clears throat> we talked about why it slopes downward Remember, the key to, to remembering those explanations is to remember that national income identity, Y equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. So we talked about why it slopes down and we talked about what causes it to shift around. And it, all of those explanations had to do with those things. And then we talked about the long run aggregate supply. What what determines the amount of output we can produce in the long run, and that has to do with the amount of real inputs and the technology that we've got, land, labor and capital and natural resources, technology. And now we've talked about the short run aggregate supply. And we've seen that in the short run, firms can make mistakes about the price level. There, or it could be that wages are sticky, or it could be that output prices are sticky. And so when the price level changes, firms react to that. They, they aren't fooled by that in the long run, and they don't make those mistakes in the long run, but in the short run they can. And so we talked about the short run aggregate supply curve and why it slopes upward, and then what causes it to shift. All of these same things as the long run aggregate supply, but now the expected price level is something that's really important. Firms expect a higher price level in the future, that shifts short run aggregate supply to the left. They expect a lower price level, that shifts it to the right. So now what we can do is we can take these three curves and we can start to use them to understand what happens in an economy when, when things change, okay? So, we're going to be thinking about two causes of economic fluctuations. Two causes 
of economic fluctuations. And the two things that we're going to think about are going to be shifts in aggregate demand and shifts in aggregate supply. I'm not going to distinguish right there between short run and long run aggregate supply. But what we want to do is we want to think about figuring out what long run equilibrium looks like in this particular model. So let's think about what we mean by long run equilibrium. So to be in long run equilibrium means that we are also in short run equilibrium. Remember we talked about the idea behind an equilibrium when we were thinking about uh, the basic demand and supply model. An equilibrium is a, 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 a situation of rest where things won't change unless something outside of the model changes. So let me show you what long run equilibrium looks like in this aggregate demand aggregate supply model. So if we think about, we've got price level up here, real GDP down here, We've got an aggregate demand curve that's downward sloping. It looks like this. We've got a long run aggregate supply curve that's vertical. It looks like this. Long run aggregate supply. It is vertical at the natural rate of output. And then we've got a short run aggregate supply. Now I'm going to draw my short run aggregate supply curve right up through that intersection of my long run aggregate supply and my aggregate demand. There's short run aggregate supply. All three of those are intersecting at the same place. And just like the basic demand and supply model, the intersection of those gives us the equilibrium. So the coordinates of this point tell us the price level we'll call it P1, and the level of income in the economy, Y1. That's the level of GDP. So let's talk about being in short run and long run equilibrium. Let's start with the short run. Well, if we're interested in what the short run equilibrium looks like, we need to look at the intersection between the aggregate demand curve and the short run aggregate supply curve. And that intersection happens right there. If we want to think about long run equilibrium, then we want to look at the intersection between the aggregate demand curve and the long run aggregate supply curve. And we see that that intersection also takes place right there. So we are in both short run and long run equilibrium. Now, we can be in a short run equilibrium and not be in long run equilibrium. But we cannot be in long run equilibrium without at the same time being in short run equilibrium. What that means is in the short run something that can happen to push us to a short run equilibrium but then over time we will move to a long run equilibrium. Okay? So it's important that you understand where we start. I'm typically going to label our starting point point A. We're always, anytime we use this model, we're going to start with a picture of long run equilibrium and then we're going to shift one of these curves and we're going to move to a short run equilibrium. And then we'll think about what happens as we move to a long run equilibrium. So what I want to do is clear this off and then we'll work through a couple of examples of shifts in aggregate demand and shifts in aggregate supply. Let's take a look at what happens when aggregate demand shifts. Now, what I want you to do is you're taking notes here is draw another picture of that long run equilibrium um, so that we can work through it and you don't mess up in your notes what that picture looks like because you need to know where we start there. So I'm going to draw it again. Let's uh, start with price level, real GDP, aggregate demand. I'm going to put my long run aggregate supply curve and my short run aggregate supply curve right up through there. I'm going to label my initial intersection there, point A. I'm going to call my initial price level P1 and my initial level of real GDP Y1. 
So now let's think about um, putting a story together here. So we're going to start at A. Price level is equal to P1. Real GDP, I'm going to say Y is equal to Y1. Now remember that real GDP is income. So this is essentially the income of, the, of everyone in the economy. Right there. Now, what's not shown on this picture is unemployment and other things, but we'll talk about how those things change when the real level of GDP changes. So we're starting at A. Let's suppose that something happens that causes aggregate demand to decrease. Suppose there's a decrease in aggregate demand. Now, let's just review the things that cause that. A decrease in aggregate demand can be caused by um, people being pessimistic, it can be caused by a terrorist attack, it can be caused by a war, it can be caused by a virus. COVID-19 can cause people to be pessimistic, not go out into the um, economy and spend money, and especially when the government is forcing people not to go out. They're being prevented from going out and spending money. So that can cause a big decrease in aggregate demand. And so that's exactly part of the explanation for what we've seen um, with the, uh, the impact of the lockdown with the pandemic. So we've got aggregate demand. Let's shift that aggregate demand curve to the left. I'm gonna move it from aggregate demand one to aggregate demand two. So we get a decrease in aggregate demand, let's say two, aggregate demand two. Now, we need to think first about what happens in the short run, and then we're going to think about what happens in the long run. So let's start with the short run. In order to figure out the place that this economy is going to go in the short run, we need to look at the aggregate demand curve and the short run aggregate supply curve. Right here will be where this economy will go in the short run. I'm going to call that new intersection point B. And the coordinates of that point B are going to give us the new price level, which is going to be P2. It's going to give us the new level of real GDP, which will be Y2. So what we see is we get a new equilibrium at B. The price level falls to P2. And real GDP falls to Y2. So real GDP incomes falls to Y2. The economy is in a recession. What we've had is a decrease in the price level we've had a decrease in incomes. And the bigger that shift in aggregate demand, the bigger the decrease in real GDP. Now, let's think about what's going on behind the scenes. So, less goods and services are being bought and sold. And what that means is that firms are selling less goods and services, which means they need fewer workers. And so, in the background, not shown on this picture, but we know something that happens when real GDP goes down is unemployment goes up. So there's also going to be increases in unemployment while this happens. There's going to be increases in uh, the number of people who can't pay their debts. So banks will start to foreclose on, on um, house loans that, and car loans that people have stopped paying off because maybe they don't have, a, have a, a job to earn money to do it. So other bad things, decreases in uh, profits for firms, increases in foreclosures as I said. So here at point B we're in a recession. Now let's think about the long run. So notice that one of the things that's happened is that the price level has gone down. So firms will expect a lower price level in the future. Let's, let's think about 
all of the different possibilities that could happen here once we're at um, this recession point, this point B. The first thing is we can think about whether government should do something. So let's, let's ask this question, what should government do? Well, there are a couple of things that the government could do. We talked about the fact that a change in government spending, G, or a change in the money supply will also shift aggregate demand. So one possibility is for the government to increase government spending and shift the aggregate demand curve back where it came from. Now, that clearly won't work in the case of a pandemic where the government does not want people going back out into the economy to spend dollars. And so, if, let, let's suppose that this was a recession that was caused by, say, a terrorist attack. And people get pessimistic about the future, but there's no reason that those people can't interact out there in restaurants and stores and, and things like that. In that case, we might say, well, if, if aggregate demand shifts to the left because of this wave of consumer pessimism that, that came about because of the terrorist attack, then let's increase G. So one possibility is to increase G and or increase the money supply. Let's write that out, increase money supply. Both of those things have the effect of shifting aggregate demand to the right. So if the government were to act quickly and decisively, they could theoretically shift the aggregate demand curve back where it came from and move us back from point B to point A. That's a possibility. What we tend to see is that as a practical matter, the government typically can't react quick enough by design. There are are checks and balances built into the political system that prevent the government oftentimes from moving rapidly enough to actually achieve what they want to achieve. But there's no reason theoretically that they couldn't think about doing that. And, and we tend to see these things happen. The government tends to do these things during periods of recession. Um, so that's a possibility there's a lot of dispute amongst economists as to whether or not the government is actually successful when it tries to do this. But there's another thing that could happen. Even if the government doesn't do anything, let's say even if the government does nothing, the recession will eventually end. And here's why. Let's say we'll eventually end. We don't know how long this will take. Here's why. Notice that the price level is below what firms expected. So firms will adjust their expectations about the price level. Now, if you think back a few minutes, you'll remember that one of the things that shifts the short run aggregate supply curve is firms expectations about the price level in the future. So if firms expect a lower price level in the future, then that shifts short run aggregate supply curve to the right. So the price level has fallen. This means that firms expect lower prices in the future. Firms expect lower prices in the future. And let's just say here that, remember that the impact of that when they adjust their expectations about the price level is that we're going to have an increase in short run aggregate supply. When firms expect lower prices in the future, they're going to expect to be able to pay less for inputs in the future. That shifts short run aggregate supply curve to the right. Remember, that's not going to change the long run aggregate supply curve, but what happens is as that short run aggregate supply curve shifts, as firms adjust their expectations, it's going to shift 
until we get to a new long run equilibrium right down here at point C. So we get a rightward shift of the short run aggregate supply curve from short run aggregate supply one to short run aggregate supply two. We get a new long run equilibrium right back here at point C. Notice that that occurs at a lower price level of P3. And also notice that what's happened is that real incomes have gone down in the short run, but then they went back in the long run as firms adjusted their expectations about the price level. So we go into a, we start at point A, not in a recession. We move to a recession at point B. Even if we do nothing, eventually what will happen is through firms adjusting their expectations of the price level, we move to a new long run equilibrium there at point C. Incomes are back where they started. The price level is lower than where it started. So we get a new equilibrium at C. Price falls to P3. Let's say price level falls to P3. Income or real GDP, real GDP is back to Y1. It went down to Y2 in the short run, came back to Y1 in the long run. If we were to look at, say, a picture of what the price level looks like in the short run, so let's put uh, time on our horizontal axis, let's put the price level up here, price level, this is P. We could also think about what happens to income, so let's put Y up here, this is real GDP or income, let's write both of those, real GDP, income, also put time on the horizontal axis. Let's put here uh, P1 and uh, Y1. And so when we start at, out at our initial equilibrium at point A, then what's happening as we, let's suppose we're just sitting at that long run equilibrium, then if we looked at what the price level looked like over time, it would be sitting there at P1. And our real income would be sitting there at Y1. And then all of a sudden, the aggregate demand curve shifts. Now remember that the aggregate demand curve shifted here because we thought about a terrorist attack or maybe it's this pandemic where the government says you can't go out and spend things. Let's go with the terrorist attack though. What typically happens with a terrorist attack is that people fear that things will be bad in the future. And notice what happens with that. The fear is self-fulfilling. Fearing a recession creates the recession. That's why a lot of economists have very mixed feelings with how the media talks about recessions. The more the media talks about how bad the recession is and how long it's lasted, the more we would expect it to be bad and last longer. So the best thing, to, one of the best things to, to help with that is to try to, to be optimistic about what the future looks like. I don't know exactly what that means in terms of whether or not you can have public policy around that. I mean, that, that's very, very challenging. You can't, it's hard to be optimistic when things are bad. Um, so, but the idea here is that pessimism, fear of a bad outcome, at least with an economy like this, will create the bad outcome. So what we saw was that when that aggregate demand curve shifted, we saw the price level fall and we saw real GDP fall, not necessarily by the same amounts here. And then we move to that equilibrium there at point B and we're sitting at that equilibrium. So maybe the price level kind of levels out and real GDP levels out there for a while. And then over time, either if the government were to shift aggregate demand back to the right, in that case, we'd move back to point A and the price level would go back to P1. But in our picture, over time, the short run aggregate supply curve shifted to the right as firms adjusted their expectations about uh, 
the price level. And what happened was the price level fell even more and we moved to a new long run equilibrium at point C. And then we're just going to sit there at point C. In terms of incomes, real GDP came back up where it started. And so what we would experience as, as real GDP goes from Y2 back to Y1 is that unemployment would be going down, um, profits would be going up, foreclosures would be going down. As people's income returns back to where it started, things get better and incomes go down and then come back up. But in this picture, the price level fell. Typically what we see is that with Recessions that are created by a shift in aggregate demand, we tend to see those being deflationary. They tend to drive the price level down. If we think about kind of some historical times when this happened, um, we could think about the early 1930s. So if we're thinking about um, the 1930s, what we saw there was real GDP fell GDP fell by about 27%. Close to a, a third was the decrease in um, incomes, real incomes. We also saw unemployment of about 25%. Um, a quarter of the people who wanted to work couldn't find a job. Price level fell by about 22%. And if you think about what happened with the Great Depression, there are lots of different opinions amongst different groups of economists as to exactly what caused the Great Depression. And um, there's, there's overlap between different groups of economists, but kind of the generally accepted explanation for what happened was that at the end of the 1920s, the 1920s were great, but at the end of the 1920s, the stock market crashed. And what ended up happening was that created this wave of pessimism. And about the same time that happened, there were some runs on banks. There were some banks that started having problems and what ended up taking place was that um, even though the Federal Reserve existed at that time, it didn't do its job. And so people started pulling their money out of the banking system. And that we know that when money gets pulled out of the banking system, the um, money supply is going to fall drastically. And so what happened was the Fed did not try to counteract that. And so at the same time, you've got people feeling very pessimistic about the future, which shifts aggregate demand to the left. You also had huge decreases in the money supply, which also shifts aggregate demand to the left. And so we saw then exactly what this model would predict. We saw declines in real income. We saw increases in un unemployment that went along with that. And we saw the price level fall. Um, if we think about the 1940s, let's say the early 1940s, at that point, the um, Great Depression was over, and the thing that got us out of the Great Depression was the U.S. entering World War II. And what happened when the U.S. entered World War II is that we had to gear up to fight a major war. Government spending increased by a lot, and that shifts aggregate demand to the right. So in the 40s, we had an increase in aggregate demand um, because of World War II. So we had government spending increase by about fivefold. Um, it nearly doubled real GDP. Nearly doubled real GDP. And think about what that means. It nearly doubled real incomes in the U.S. So when we see an increase in aggregate demand, we would expect the opposite of what's happened here. We would expect an increase in aggregate demand to drive the price level up and drive real GDP up, which we saw. There was also a 20% increase in the price level, 
and unemployment went from about 17% down to 1%, lowest it's been in the history of the U.S. So unemployment fell to 1%. There are lots of other minor recessions. Those are really good examples of um, recessions or expansions that are created by a shift in aggregate demand. One of the challenging things is that with, with any recession, it's often hard to put your finger on exactly what's happened. So if we were to look at the recession, um, the U.S. has experienced many recessions. Um, one of the last ones that we experienced prior to 2020 was um, the 2008-2009 recession. And there are lots of opinions as to what led to that recession. What was it? There were dot-com failures. There were problems in the housing markets. Um, there were a lot of different things that economists kind of debate as to what was the main cause. And, and that's what makes what has happened in 2020, very interesting because we know exactly what has happened here, right? The government has prohibited people from interacting economically. The government essentially has put the economy into a deep freeze, hoping that it can thaw it back out. And so um, it, it has forcibly prevented transactions between people, not all transactions, but it's placed a lot of restrictions that prohibit many types of transactions. Um, so, the other interesting thing about what's happened in 2020 is that um, it wasn't just created by a change in aggregate demand, it was also created by a change in aggregate supply, and we'll talk about that next. So, I'm gonna clear this off, and then we'll think about um, maybe running through a simple example of this without quite so much detail, and then we'll do a, uh, a shift in aggregate supply. Let's do a, another quick example of a change in aggregate demand, but this time let's shift aggregate demand to the right. So if we were to remember, we're always going to be starting with a picture of long run equilibrium. So we've got an aggregate demand curve. I'm going to shift it, so I'm going to call that one aggregate demand one. Price levels up here, real GDP long run aggregate supply, short run aggregate supply. I'm also going to shift short run aggregate supply, so we'll call that one. Put our initial equilibrium right here at point A. Here's our initial price level, P1, and our initial level of real GDP, Y1. I'm not going to write out the story for all of this. I'll just talk through it. You, it might be good to write it down in your notes just to kind of keep track of what's going on as we move through it. Let's suppose that instead of a decrease in aggregate demand, let's suppose there's an increase in aggregate demand. Um, and that could be caused by um, a stock market boom. Um, it could be caused by the end of a war. It could be caused by entering into a war, an aggregate demand increasing because of an increase in government spending. But for whatever reason, let's suppose Aggregate demand shifts to the right to aggregate demand curve two. So we get a rightward shift in aggregate demand. In the short run, we're going to move to a long run, or excuse me, a short run equilibrium right here at point B. And the coordinates of that point show us that we're going to have an increase in real GDP to Y2, and we're going to have an increase in the price level to P2. And this economy would be in what we would call an expansion. Now, when we were thinking about a recession, we talked about why the government might have an incentive to step in and, and try to end that recession. Clearly, there would be no incentive to try to end things when things are going well. So we wouldn't say, well, the government's going to try to, you know, uh, decrease incomes back down. But what will happen is that we know that this recession will end eventually because the price level has gone up and firms are going to expect to have to pay more for inputs in the future. 
So as firms adjust their expectations of the price level, this short run aggregate supply curve is going to shift to the left and it's going to shift to the left enough that we move to a new long run equilibrium right up here at point C. So here's our new short run aggregate supply curve. It's shifted to the left. We move to a new long run equilibrium at point C. That occurs at an even higher price level of P3. And now our real GDP has gone back to Y1. So in the short run, when real GDP is up here at Y2, incomes have gone up. We would observe that unemployment has gone down. Profits will have gone up. Foreclosures would have gone down. Now income is back where it started there at Y1. So the expansion is over and we've got an even higher price level. So typically what we tend to see is that an expansion that's created by an increase in, in aggregate demand tends to be inflationary. So that gives you an idea. Notice that in what we've done right here and what we did right before this, the long run aggregate supply curve never shifted because we didn't change technology. We didn't change the amount of inputs that we've got. So the amount, our natural rate of output hasn't changed here. And also notice that your long run equilibrium is always found on that long run aggregate supply curve. Okay. In the short run, we can move to a, a, a place to the right of that aggregate supply curve, long run aggregate supply curve, or a place to the left. But notice that the short run aggregate supply curve is in the long run going to shift to bring us back onto that long run aggregate supply curve. So that gives you both an decrease in aggregate demand and an increase in aggregate demand. Let's talk about a shift in aggregate supply. So let's say shift in um, aggregate supply. Now we could have some event that causes a permanent shift in aggregate supply, meaning that let's say there's a war in your country and a lot of people get killed. Then that means there's fewer workers and in that case, both your long run aggregate supply and your short run aggregate supply are going to shift to the left because now you can produce less output than before. Or we could have temporary decreases in aggregate supply. So let's say a bad weather event. Let's say there's a, a uh, I don't know, unusually high temperatures cause a decrease in agricultural production or something like that. Well, that we would think of as a temporary decrease in aggregate supply. In that case, the long run aggregate supply won't move, but the short run aggregate supply curve will. Okay, we're going to think about that type of aggregate supply shift. The type where short run aggregate supply shifts and long run aggregate supply does not. And the reason we're going to do that is it's simpler. Um, so let's talk about that. Let's suppose that we draw a picture here where we've got our long run equilibrium. So we've got aggregate demand. We've got our long run aggregate supply. And we've got our short run aggregate supply. Let's call that short run aggregate supply one. Let's start with our initial equilibrium right there at point A. Initial price level of P1. Let's label our axes. There's price level. There's real GDP. Here's our initial level of income, real GDP, Y1. So let's do a, a short story here. We're going to start at A, price level is equal to P1, real GDP is equal to Y1. And now let's suppose that um, something drives up the cost of production for producers. Maybe it's that the price of oil causes the price of gas to go up. Um, it, as I said, it could be a, an adverse weather event. There are a lot of things that can cause temporary disruptions in um, producers' ability to produce. So let's shift our short run aggregate supply curve to the left. We get a decrease in short run aggregate supply to short run aggregate supply two. So Short run aggregate supply decreases. Let's say suppose short run aggregate supply decreases. 
Let's think about where we move in the short run. In the short run, the impact of this is going to be that our intersection of aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply is going to be right here at point B. And so we get a higher price level, P2, and we get a lower level of real GDP, we'll call it Y2. So we move to point B. In the short run, um, we get an increase in price level and a decrease in real GDP. And let's think about what's happening there. So that's a recession. Real GDP has gone down. Notice that this is going to be a particularly painful type of recession. If we were to go back to the first example that I went, where, or that I did, where we had a decrease in aggregate demand, what we saw was a decrease in aggregate demand sends the economy into a recession, but it drives the price level down. That, that's kind of like a silver lining. You know, the incomes are going down, but at least the price level has fallen. So you've, everybody's got less money to spend, but at least the prices of goods and services has gone down. If we have a recession that's created by a shift in aggregate supply, then not only do incomes go down, but the prices of everything go up. That's a really painful type of recession. and We've actually got a name for that. We call this stagflation. Very painful type of recession. It's the combination of, of stagnation and inflation. Stagnation referring to incomes going down, income growth becoming stagnant, and inflation, which is the price level going up. Okay. So any type of recession that's caused by the supply side of the economy, that's caused by a shift in aggregate supply, those are going to be more painful than the recessions that are caused by the demand side of the economy, a change in aggregate demand. So let's think about what the government can do. What can government do? Well, there's not a lot of good options. One possibility is that the government can increase government spending or increase the money supply to shift aggregate demand to the right. And if the, they did that and it shifted aggregate demand to the right, we would move to a new long-run equilibrium up here at point C. But the problem with that is that that causes the price level to go up even more. That's, it, it causes incomes to go back up, but it causes more inflation. And so you can't offset both of these things at the same time. You can't go back to point A unless you just ride it out. So let's just say an increase in aggregate demand, an increase in aggregate demand would increase real GDP. I'm going to say why but also cause inflation. If you think back to one of those basic principles of economics, you'll remember that one of them was that in the short run there's a trade-off between unemployment and inflation. And that's exactly what we're seeing right here. You can't fix both of those. If you want to decrease unemployment, which would happen if you increased real GDP. If you want to decrease unemployment, it comes at a price, and the price is it's going to cause inflation. They could, remember, increase aggregate demand. That should be an increase in aggregate demand by increasing either government spending or the money supply. Okay. The other thing is do nothing. So let's say or do nothing. Eventually, that adverse weather event that caused the decrease in aggregate supply, eventually that will be over, and the economy, as the short run aggregate supply curve shifted back to the right, the economy would move back to point A. So let's say eventually, whatever caused the decrease in aggregate supply, will be over. 
and then we go back to point A. Here's the problem with that. Politicians are very hesitant to publicly choose this option. And the reason is, is that people tend to vote them out of office if they don't, if they're not doing something. That's an unfortunate thing for all of us because there are many times when it would be better for us all if the government did not do something. Not always, but there are times when that's the case. So the right thing for the government to do might be to not do anything. Because if they do something, it's going to create a different problem or it's going to be a waste of money. But they face a very strong incentive to, to be proactive, to try to do things. And so they do tend to do things. And sometimes it creates other problems. Sometimes it causes problems that we've got to become even worse. Um, so, if you're wondering, well, why is it that, that politicians always do something when doing nothing might be the best thing? Well, it's hard to just say, hey, you know what, uh, we're going to do nothing. We know things are bad, but the best thing to do is to do nothing. If everybody had had an economics class and everybody understood the economics of how markets tend to work, then that might be an easier sell, but uh, not everybody understands that. So with uh, stagflation, that tends to be pretty painful. Um, I want to clear this off and then just kind of talk about what has happened with the, um, the pandemic, because actually what we've got in this particular case is the combination of a shift in aggregate demand and a shift in aggregate supply, and it's caused things to be especially bad. So let me clear this off and then we'll, take, we'll finish up with that. This aggregate demand, aggregate supply model is really useful for trying to figure out what's going on in an economy. And most of the time, what we tend to see is that when the economy experiences expansions or, or uh, recessions, that they're almost always caused by a change in aggregate demand or a change in aggregate supply. It's pretty rare for both of those things to happen at the same time. That's not to say that it doesn't happen, but um, it, it's not that common. And what that means is that, you know, it, it's a lot of times easier to kind of diagnose what's happened and, and, you know, it may not be easy to figure out exactly why aggregate demand decreased. Um, sometimes, you know, if you look at the example we talked about earlier, the Great Depression or the recession of 08 and 09, it, economists debate what they think caused the changes in aggregate demand. What we've had happen in 2020 is if we think about what's going on here, we've had a change in aggregate demand and a change in aggregate supply and it was essentially government forced. And so if we think about the price level and real GDP, we've got our aggregate demand curve. Let's put our long run aggregate supply and our short run aggregate supply and our initial equilibrium at point A. Now, what has happened is that the long run aggregate supply curve has not changed. We haven't um, had a, a situation where we've lost a lot of natural resources or um, where the labor force has shrunk because we've had a war and a lot of people got killed. That has not happened. A, a overwhelming majority of the, the deaths that have taken place have been amongst people that are already retired. So the the labor force hasn't changed. Our natural rate of output hasn't changed. But what has happened is that the government has essentially forced the closure of, of a majority of businesses in the economy. And so what happens is when the government tells you you can't go out and engage in transactions, then people quit spending their money. And so what we've seen is that we've had a decrease in aggregate demand from aggregate demand one to aggregate demand two. That's the first part. But the government also forced down, the, forced the closure of most of the firms in the economy. 
Well, that means those firms are not producing anything. That's a decrease in short run aggregate supply. So these firms aren't producing less because of some adverse weather event. They're producing less because the government has told them they can't be open. And so we get a decrease in short run aggregate supply. Let me draw it over here. So there's short run aggregate supply too. What that means is that we need to look at the intersection of our two, two new curves and that intersection is going to be somewhere over here. Call it point B. And what that means is we have a relatively large decrease in income. And if we look at what's happened to real GDP, and the picture will become clearer as we're able to get this farther in hindsight and, and we're able to actually look at, at what the data looks like, what we're going to see is that this is going to create a very, very large decrease in real GDP. And it's easy to understand exactly what's going on. This isn't a mystery. We know what happened. The government policy has put us into this situation. And, and there can be a lot of debate about um, whether or not the government should have taken those steps. That's certainly available for debate. But we understand exactly where those steps have put us. We also understand fairly easily what's going to happen when those things are removed. So if the government were to remove those restrictions, then the short run aggregate supply curve would shift back, aggregate demand eventually would shift back, and we'd move back to point A. Now, how long that takes, nobody knows. That is something that is yet to be seen, and it will certainly depend upon um, whether firms can open, the extent to how much they can sell once they are open. If, um, if you make your money selling seats in a theater and all of a sudden the government tells you that you can only have 30% of the seats that you could before, you're not going to be able to make as much money as you could before. And so you're not going to be able to sell as many seats. And so as the economy starts to reopen and we start to see what restrictions get lifted and what new restrictions might get uh, put into place, we're going to see what, what uh, type of, of recovery we have. But the nice thing about this recession is it's easy to understand what put us at point B. Now, where we go from point B, we'll have to see, as I said. So this is a, a relatively um, interesting and unusual type of recession. But again, this aggregate demand, aggregate supply model is very useful for thinking about how changes in government spending will affect the economy, how changes in weather events, how um, terrorist attacks or a virus, how those things might impact the economy. This is a very useful model for understanding what causes recessions, what causes them to happen, what causes them to end. What we'll do in our final section of material that we're going to cover in our next um, set of videos is that we're going to look specifically at the aggregate demand curve and the impact that changes in the money supply have. So we'll take a look at that in our next video. I'll see you then.